But to thank you so much for your graciousness and kindness to us. It's really, really appreciated. We really feel a kinship. Amen. Thank God for a Amen. common in the Savior, a common Amen. agreement in the book. Amen. And so Colossians chapter 1 and then Isaiah 50. Have, has anybody uh, been able to take a trip to Israel? Anybody been there? Okay. Well, with my limited ability, I'm going to try to describe uh, the events of the Passion Week and the crucifixion. Okay, if you've not been to Israel, you, you can get online and look at YouTube and Google Earth and you can kind of take a trip there without going there. <laughs> save the expense and save the tension when you go through. Because you can feel the Muslims and the Jews and all that stuff. But it's so much different than we think. Uh, and there is an advantage when you could see like uh, the environment and then you can... Uh, put the circumstances together and discover where things actually happen. So a lot of times when people take trips to Israel, it's usually, it's usually a counterfeit thing where they'll take you to a site and say that happened here, but in reality it possibly happened over here. Okay, most everybody when they go to Israel in Jerusalem, they go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. That will be packed out with people. That's a Catholic church. They have a marble slab. They say that's where the Lord was buried, and people will sit there and slobber on the slab and all this stuff. And, and hardly anybody goes to the garden tomb. And it's freebie to go there, and all the, circumst all the characteristics line up with the Bible. And so I'm going to try to describe some of that. I'm going to not just describe, as we often are, limited in the visible world. I'm going to delve into the invisible world at the same time, okay, because we don't think of it, but, you know, we are in a parallel universe, okay, so if you and I would have our eyes open to see, you know, the spiritual world right now, we'd probably pass out, <laughs> okay, and on occasion, the Lord does allow people to see it, he's never allowed me to see it, you know, maybe I looked in a mirror early in the morning, I see something, oh, that is definitely not physical world, uh, but I, I do have a lady in the Lowell Church that says that she saw my guardian angel standing behind me when I was preaching. She said, he is a big dude. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. I, I don't doubt her testimony. I don't call her a liar, all that things. Maybe she did. You don't know. Yeah. Okay. And I'm certain it wasn't parents. You know, <laughs> I, I'm certain it wasn't him. I'm hoping it wasn't him. <laughs> You know, it's a wonderful life. But um, there is a visible and invisible world. Right. Okay, and everywhere we go, we need to recognize that. In Colossians 1, verse 15, who is, the in, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Of course, that's the Lord Jesus. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Okay, whether they be thrones, okay, a visible throne and an invisible throne, right. dominions and principalities and powers, be they visible, be they invisible, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Okay, now in the Isaiah 50 passage, the Isaiah 50 is stepping into the invisible world of the Lord Jesus Christ trash-talking, taunting Satan during the beatings and the crucifixion. That, that's what the Lord is doing, and he is egging it on. That's how powerful our Savior Amen. is. Isaiah 50, verse 5. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away my back. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, I hid not my face from the shame and spitting. Obviously, we see who he's talking about. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. 
A lot of people talk about, oh, Jesus was emotional and he was going back and forth. No, no. not at all. He was determined to do this. In verse 8, he is near that justifieth me. The he that's near is Satan. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together face to face. When that sun rolled us back at noon, this is when this took place. And he says, who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as with a garment. The moth shall eat them up. Okay, that's the invisible war there. Okay, so uh, to describe Israel and Jerusalem a little bit, okay, we got to put outside of your mind concrete, trees, grass, okay, just put all that outside of your mind. It's built on a rock. Okay, the city of Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem is about 200 acres, very small. You can walk around the old city of Jerusalem in about an hour, an hour, 15 minutes. So it's very, very small. Okay, we tend to think it's huge. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. How little is that? Ten acres. That's it. So everything was compacted, just like it says in Psalms 102 or 122 about Jerusalem. Okay, so Jerusalem is built in a rock. Okay, on the eastern side of the city, if you walk out of the city, you'll go down into a little valley, and to the right, if you walk out of the north, the northeast corner gate, you go down to a little valley, and on the right-hand side is a graveyard, not a graveyard like ours, it's all rock, so they have like mausoleums on top the ground, 175,000 graves. The Jewish people want to be buried there because they think that's where the judgment's going to start and they want to get first in line. Okay, that's the thinking. And you come around that about a five, about a 10 minute walk, you're coming up to the Garden of Gethsemane and then a little further up is the Mount of Olives. Okay, this is on the eastern side. When you come around the southern side, on the southern edge is where Bethlehem is. That's all Muslim-dominated territory. And you come around the, the gate of Jerusalem. You come around this way, and then there's a valley, and the valley curves around this way. That valley is called the Valley of Hinnon. Do you remember what happened in the Valley of Hinnon? Child sacrifices. Right outside the wall, those kings would be sacrificing children. It would be guarded with soldiers, obviously, very similar to the... Um, uh, Bohemian Grove out in California. And so right over there is where Satan would get worship, and that's how he would divvy out political power. And it's right there in that Valley of Hinnon. If you go outside, and when you at the temple, at the, at the Wailing Wall, the Wailing Wall, you have the women on one side, the men on the other side. And you come around, and it's not concrete, it's stone, stone, stones everywhere you go, meaning just a stone, stone uh, uh, ground. You come up this way, and then you walk through the, city, through the city itself. The city of Jerusalem is divided in four quarters. You have the Armenian section, the Muslim section. You have a, they call it Christian section, but we know it's the Catholic section. Okay, and then you have the Jewish section. So it's quartered. All those are lovely, peace, and harmony. <laughs> okay? And so you're coming through, you're walking through this, not cars, you're walking through these buildings. It's probably maybe 30 feet wide, and you're go, walking through cobblestones, and then maybe a road will go this way or a street, but it's all walking, no cars in there. And they walk this way. Now, when you walk outside of Jerusalem, Okay, you're coming out the north gate, and you walk up these stairs, and then you, there's a highway that comes across. This highway is like a main thoroughfare. In the days of the Lord, it was a main thoroughfare for commerce, where men would walk past that way, and then they can go south to Egypt. They'd go north up in this direction. So it was a place that was well known for multiple languages. Of course, we know why when we get to the cross. Right across from there, it's only, it's, man, it's just a five-minute walk from the wall, uh, from the gate until where the crucifixion site is. Okay, we tend to think the old rugged cross on a hill far away. Yes, it's on a hill far away for us, 
But for the Jews, it was in your face, ground level. Okay, it's a street that comes across, and back in those days, it was a walking thoroughfare. Today, it's a bus station. The Muslims own it. The garden tomb is right next to it. So when you walk away from the bus station, you come around a corner, and you come around this way, and then you can walk into the garden tomb. And the garden tomb has a sepulcher that's been hewn out of a rock. It's got a, a, vine, a wine press, because that's what Joseph at Arimathea had. Okay, and then it's got on the face, on the edge of the garden tomb, there is a face in the rock, the face of the skull. Now, it, it's not so prevalent today. It's kind of hard to see today because four years ago they had a snowstorm and it knocked the nose off of it. Okay, when you see pictures of the early 1900s, the face looks like an alien face, if you can imagine that. Okay, and so at the foot of that is where Calvary was, where they had the stakes in the ground. Now, I traveled to Israel in 1997 with a guy named Ron Wyatt. He did a lot of archaeology study there. He is well known by the Jews there, but they're afraid of him. And so this is how I got a lot of this information from this gentleman. Okay, and so we went down a Red Sea crossing site, all this stuff. It was a wonderful trip. Okay, that was in 97. We took our second trip in 2000. Uh, my wife got to go this time. My daughter, Ash, Lindsay, got to go. My mom and dad were able to go. But on the very first day of the tour, a lady fell into my mother and broke her leg. And so we had to take her to the hospital. So that was on a Tuesday. And so we're in and out trying to get this thing figured out. And Friday, we flew out. So on Wednesday and Thursday, when I was by myself, I was able to walk down to the garden tomb, and I took my dad on a couple of tours while mom was in the hospital. Okay, but on this time around, I realized that the, the crucifixion site was an in-your-face idea. It wasn't on a distant mountain. It was right there in the people's face. Why? Because they produced fear. That was the intent. So that's, that's the layout. And I want to start with, um, on, the, on the Sabbath prior to the crucifixion, the 10th day of the month, the first day of the month for the Jewish calendar is our springtime. And on the 10th day of the month, remember that in the Old Testament, they would set aside a lamb. Okay, that was when Mary anointed the feet of Jesus. She was anointing the, his, for his burial. She knew the right day, the right time. Then the next day was Palm Sunday. That's when everybody laid out the palm things, the palm leaves, and they said, Hosanna to the one in the highest and all this stuff. So that's on Sunday. And we're coming through this cobblestones, people on each side, and they're throwing this down. And, you know, the Pharisees were very upset was taking place. And on Monday, Jesus cursed the fig tree. And then on Tuesday, the apostles saw that he cursed the fig tree. And then on Tuesday night, he said to Peter and John, he said, I want you to go such and such place, and we're going to observe the Passover. At that time, when he was preparing, the, preparing for the Passover, during that time, all 12 disciples showed up. Okay, so all 12 are there. And Jesus mentioned while they were eating, they had a meal. And then he mentioned during the meal that one of you are going to betray me. And then each one was basically saying, who is, is it I, is it I, is it I, is it I? And then John, as he was leaning on Jesus Christ, said, who is it? And then he said, well, just watch. Watch here a little bit. And uh, he said, uh, it's the one I'm going to dip the sop in. Okay, when he did that, okay, that's when he introduced the New Testament at that time. And then he gave the uh, bread and the wine to each of the apostles. And when he handed it to Judas Iscariot, looked in his eyes, he said, that thou doest do quickly. And Judas headed to the door. And while he was heading to the door, a spirit came in him. Satan indwelled him. Judas was a devil. He was a walking, talking devil that manifested himself to be a man. He was a seed of Satan. Satan has a genetic program. He has a breeding program. 
Okay, and Judas is a result of that. And not only is he a result of that, that some of the chief priests are a result of that, because Jesus said to them, Ye are of your father the devil. Was he speaking figuratively or literally? I'm buying literally. Okay, and so when, when Judas, indwelt by Satan, walks out as, as Satan is talking to him, and he's talking to Satan back and forth, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? He said, well, I can't leave a man's job to a boy. I'm going to make sure we get this done. And so then he says, we're going to go see a couple of your brothers. So he heads right over to the chief priest, and he said, how are you doing, sons? He said, we got a job. And he said, the job we're going to do is much better than what we've ever done at the Valley of Hinnon. We're going to feast on God tonight. And so he got those, uh, he got the chief priests, they got their ducks in a row, and uh, then they set up how he's going to betray him. Judas Iscariot is still indwelt by the devil. And then they, Judas knows where Jesus Christ prays. He knows where with their, their apostles. And so after they left that night, they went back up to their general area, Garden of Gethsemane, Mount of Olives. Judas shows up with a few soldiers. And at that time, when they showed up, Jesus, how did he, how did he address Judas Iscariot? He said, friend. He said, friend. Why? Because the devil does the bidding of God. Okay, and, and the devil in his mind, he said, we're going to feast on God tonight. I am going to be king. I am going to be God. And so the betrayal took place in the coolness and the darkness and the secret of the night. And the Pharisees were scurrying like rats. But if you remember, when they came to Jesus, said, who are you looking for? What did he say? He said, I am. Yeah. And how did they respond? They fell down. Now remember, to the le to the uh, as he's facing Jerusalem, to his left, or if you're walking out there, to the right is a cemetery. And I'm kind of wondering. This is just kind of uh, guessing. I'm kind of wondering when he said, "I am," that power came out, and a kid over there in that sepulcher came up. And then there's a young man who comes and grabs him by the feet, and he left his linen clothes and took off naked. Would that be the power of Jesus Christ? I'm not sure. It's just something to think about. Okay, and that's when Peter took that sword and cut that guy's ear off. You know, he's trying to take his head off, but he cut his ear off, and then the Lord put the head back on, or the ear back on. So through the coolness of the night, then they're trying to scurry, trying to scurry together to get this trial going, this fake trial that they got going on. And so right a little bit before sunup, during the coolness of the morning, they're kind of getting this set up. And so there's the Lord Jesus Christ now standing in front of Pilate. Okay, so Pilate, as often judges do, they'll be looking through the papers and see who we got in front of me. And let me describe you to Lord Jesus while he's standing there. He's a man's man. He's about six feet, five inches tall. He said, how do you know? I measured it. In the garden tomb, I made sure this time I took a tape measure. And they had to etch out where his feet were because he was taller than Joseph of Arimathea. And I'm looking around making sure nobody comes in. I rip my tape measure. <laughs> and that's what historians often say also. About 6'5", Peter about 6'6". Six, six. He was a carpenter, the chest of 52 inches or more, standing there straight as could be, eyes as pure as a driven milk. Eyes like the dove's eyes, the natural blush on his cheeks, cheeks, and he's just standing there. He's got a strong midsection. His legs are like marbles of pillar. You'll find this description in Song of Solomon. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you couldn't see the muscles ripping on his body because he had the Jewish garments. But there he was standing there just as confident and calm, just observing everything going on. And Pilate's looking at, his, looking at the docket sheet, and he said, okay, who we got in front of me? Okay, 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 I got him, okay. Uh, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you said it. Pilate, ooh, right, ooh, that pride. How dare you talk to me this way? Do you know who I am? And he looked up with an angry look in his eyes. So who dare you talk to me like this? And then he says this, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? 
And the Lord Jesus calmly looks in his eyes and he says, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. No drama, no flash, just calm, confident, determined, a lamb going to the slaughter. Who's the one that's committing the greater sin? Satan and those chief priests. And that's the last word Pilate heard from him. And Pilate looks in his eyes, and Jesus looked in his eyes, and Pilate's like, he's looking through me. He could feel it. He could feel the innocence, the innocent eyes of a dove. And then they bring in witnesses, and the Lord just stands there. He's looking at the witnesses. Pilate's looking at him. He's looking at the witnesses. They're telling all these lies. And the Lord just looking at him. And Pilate said, he's not defending himself. This isn't natural. I've never seen a criminal stand there and let people lie about him. Something's not right here. He said, this... Jesus and Jesus looks at him and Pilate drops his eyes. He'd never seen innocence like that before. And while he's down, a courier walks in behind him. It's a note, looks at it, and it's from Mrs. Pilate. And she said, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Yeah. He folded a note up and looked at Jesus again dropped his eyes, and he thinks, and then he says, I find no fault in him. Yeah. Three times he decreed. It was a judicial decree, but a judicial decree isn't valid until it's signed. Three times. He knew that. So he's concluding in his mind, and as he's standing there, and the high priests are watching him, and the spirits inside them are watching him. They're getting the vibes back and forth. They're seeing what's going on. And Pilate's in his mind thinking, okay, 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 here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll bring that Barabbas. I'll bring that guy. He's a criminal. He's killed somebody. There's no, there's no way these people are going to accept Barabbas over Jesus. There's no possible way. So if I throw this guy in front of him, then these people will certainly, they will certainly want to release Jesus and, and, and execute Barabbas. But those unclean spirits and the chief priests over here, boy, they were stirring it up. And they could see that resolve. Those spirits were reading the vibes. And they got the, un, they got the chief priests going, and they created a drama scene. And they started calling, crucify him, crucify him. And then that drama scene started, them, those spirits went into those masses of people. And then those people, and because of the spirits, we want blood, we want blood, give us blood. The spirits were moving the people to a bloodthirsty mob. They wanted blood. Pilate was at a loss. I can't release this guy. Man, this is what's going on. And so Pilate, as soon as Pilate said, release Barabbas, it was like the spirits like dogs pounced on Jesus Christ. When he ordered that scourging, it was like unleashing dogs or wolves on a prey. It's like hyenas attacking a, a corpse or a body or a buffalo on, or a, a, you know, a gazelle on, on the wild forest. If you ever watch those nature programs, or watch how those animals will feast on them while they're living. And they pounced on it and began to brutally and meticulously torture the Lord Jesus Christ. And here this body started to be torn to shreds. And they ripped the clothes off him. And they're beating on him. And he in the spirit world saying, is that the best shot you got? Come on, do better than that. Do. He's egging it on. And that, those spirits got more and more angry. And the more they beat on him, and the more they beat on him, then they ripped his beard out. And then they got this whip out. And they started whipping on him. And a lot of those times when they would whip a person, they would end the whipping when they ripped the guy in half. Because that, that whip would come around their midsection and just start tearing away flesh, and then bones would start exposing themselves, and then the intestines, the innards would start falling out. Yeah. And when they whipped the guy too long, it would just rip him in half, and everything's just hanging out, and of course, you know he's gone by then. 
But the Lord would just egg it on and egg it on. He said, that's the best you can do. Is that the best? And those soldiers were thinking about more and more ways to kill somebody. And they knew how to kill somebody slowly. And the scourging often ended when the victim was ripped in half. The intent was the worst possible pain for the longest possible time. One of the soldiers ran in a corner. Look what I got. I got this crown of thorns. Oh, man, I got to have a pair of gloves for that thing. Let's, let's beat this on his head. So they set that on his head very gingerly, but then they took a reed or a baseball bat, tapped it down, boom, a couple times. And, and people who studied this, doctors who studied said his head probably swelled up the size of a pumpkin. And his back looked like hamburger, as you can see the intestines. And they're mocking and beating and spitting and cussing and hit him with the heels of their hand. They're beating with the brass knuckles and the rods and the blood and the bruises. And the Lord Jesus just called. We would say, is that the best you got? Come on, devil, bring it on. Give me your best shot. I'm going to make a fool out of you today. And according to Colossians 2.15, it says that he made an open, openly, he made a show of him that day in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord was egging it on, just egging it on. Colossians 2.15, it says, and, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, over them in it. It got to the time, okay, there's his cross. Now put on top of his, his name there. Jesus is Jesus, the king of the Jews. You know, make sure you get that one. Now we got the big signs out there, but we got to put that one because we got three of these crosses here. And so start carrying that. And he started carrying that cross, but his innards were probably falling out because he had ripped them so badly. And there's, here's Simon who's in there either in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time. And he's starting to drag this cross as you're going up the steps and you're going out the cobblestones and there's people on each side. And if you can imagine the people on each side, some yelling, some cussing, some throwing stuff. There's a lady or two over here crying away. Here's over here crying away. And then John's in a distance kind of watching it. And Peter's off and wherever he's at at the time. And his head is Face is swollen, blood's everywhere, his skin is shredded, his ribs or bones are sticking out, intestines are practically falling out. He couldn't carry the cross and then hold everything in. And so they grabbed this Simon and he started carrying it through. What should be a 10-minute walk took an hour as they come out the north gate. And as they keep coming up this thing, and they got to walk up these steps, about 15 or 20 steps. And as they're walking up there, the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ is trying to keep it in. And then he'd see these ladies over here crying as he's walking. And he'd say, weep not for me. Weep not for me. I mean, who would be thinking about the concerns of somebody else during that time? Yeah, weep for yourself. And then he described the tribulation to him as he's going on. You get to the crucifixion site, which, was, as I said, is eye level. That produces the greatest amount of fear for the Romans and the Jewish mafia. The Jewish mafia is still in effect. If you have a Jewish business and here comes the rabbis, if you don't foot the money, they will ruin your business. Nothing has changed in all that. When you get to the crucifixion site, <clears throat> they had the three holes in the ground. It's a place where you can put the, the cross right down in the holes in the ground. And then they had four by eight or huge billboard signs where they were up on the edge of the of the uh, rock because you see this was the remains of a stone quarry that they used the rocks there to build the walls around Jerusalem. Now when we think of a stone quarry we're thinking down in the ground. The stones there are on top. You just start right at the top. And when they made this cliff face amazingly a skull face remained in there. The face of the skull, the place of the skull. So at the foot of the skull, you've got the, the, the place where they put the rocks uh, over in here and over here and over here beside. You've got in three languages, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, this is the king of the Jews. So when people walk by, they know the accusation. They know the charge. They're sitting there watching what's taking place. They're in their, in their gut. They're saying, I am not messing with these Romans. No way. 
I don't want to die like that. And as I said, there's a small plaque on, on each of the individual cross there, and the people were deathly afraid. Now, what the people could do is they could sit there and throw stuff at them, and they could do all they want to mock them, make fun of them, just as long as they don't kill them, because that's the Romans. They want to keep this as long as possible. We're talking in the morning now. You know, 7, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock, they get up on the cross. At about 9 o'clock, they take him, they, and, and those two thieves, they're fighting just like any natural person is going to do. They're fighting, and them soldiers got to hold them down, and they finally get them down. But the Lord Jesus, when there is cross, Amen. Yeah. he just bends down, lays down, and them soldiers, oh, I've never seen this before. And then they took a spike and it came in right here. They've done this before, but that rip out. They came in right here between the bones. And they put that first peg in there. And then they put that second one. And then that cross where you got the, the legs here coming this way. And on the side, they come right before the Achilles tendon, right in front of the Achilles tendon and the bone. They put it right there, and they come across, and they nail it this way. And then they put this one and nail it this way. And then there's a little, a little wooden platform there so that he could somehow, some way, push up to breathe. And then they laid the Lord, and then they put the Lord up. The two thieves, they're doing their thing. They're yelling, they're cussing, they're screaming, Go to hell! You go to hell what you've done to me! And they're cussing and yelling, and everybody's yelling and throwing stuff. And, and then one of them, in one of the silence, he heard Jesus Christ say this, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he's looking over. You see, before this, this guy was yelling at Jesus. He was yelling at Jesus, get us out of this mess. And when he heard that, he's like, are you kidding me? Damn these people what they've done to us. Forgive them, you're crazy. But he noticed the calmness. He noticed the quietness. He noticed the determination. And it worked on his mind. Forgive them, forgive them. No, no, we can't forgive them. They forgive them. And people hold grudges. Why do people hold on to grudges? Right. And they've never experienced something like the Lord's done. Right. I mean, it was kind of surprising to me that when Kobe Bryant died a while back, here comes the Shaq man, and he says, well, he wants to get right with everybody he's done wrong. I mean, if the world's got that figured out, yeah. why wait to death? Amen. And this, this thief is saying, what? Are you kidding me? He's forgiving? That can't be. And he looks at his calmness, and then he looks over and says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Amen. Why do you say that? It's a small town. It's a small city. He'd heard about the healings. He knew what Jesus Christ preached. What did he preach? He preached the gospel of the kingdom. So he believed the right gospel. Amen. He believed in the kingdom. And by faith, he believed the gospel of the kingdom. And the Lord Jesus looked over at him, and he said, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What? No baptism? No works? No sacraments? No enduring to the end? Are you kidding? I can't imagine people saying the two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen is necessary for eternal life. I don't get that. How can you cheapen something so powerful? And before the sun turned dark, he looks over at his mother, who's standing close by, and said, Mama, behold thy son. He looks at John and says, Son, behold thy mother. Then in the quietness, he says, I thirst. Somebody went and got a sponge and gave him something to drink. And then the sun goes darkened. Off at a great distance, Judas Iscariot had realized what he had done, and he's out there hanging himself because the devil, I would say, needs release when he's in a body, and the only way to release it is through death. And so when he hangs himself, the devil hightails it back to the crucifixion, 
and two eyes poke out of those skull. And they're looking over, and he's enjoying this. I'm going to feast on God. Nobody could see the eyes, but he's in that cliff face looking over his handiwork. The eyes and the eyes of men have never recovered. And the Lord had to darken it because there was a spiritual event that was going to take place that if the natural man would have seen, they would have never recovered. Right. So around noon, something mysteriously very, very, very much happened. And while the devil's looking through the skull face, the Lord is saying, is this your best shot? Bring it on. Give me your best shot, buddy. And at that time, the devil is overseeing the crucifixion. He's reveling in the destruction and death of God. He's won. He's won. He thinks he's won. And he unleashes the entire gang to defeat God in the darkness. So people couldn't see what was going on. And according to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, He who knew no sin... Yes became Amen. sin you, for us that we Thank might be made Lord. righteous of God in Him. What does that mean? Became, became yeah, sin. Right. Yeah. In that darkness, the Lord Jesus gave His offering of His body and His soul, and He morphed into a serpentine something on that tree. And this is where the healing arts gets their healing thing. It's a pole, it's a rod with a and that came from Calvary. And that serpent, that, that serpentine, I don't understand it, but the Lord Jesus Christ gave his body and his soul to satisfy the holiness and justice of God. And then it says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah. At that moment, God the Father and God the Spirit's justice was satisfied. Yeah. And then right a little bit before 3 o'clock, the Lord Jesus said, it is finished. Amen. He did it. Amen. And people add water yeah. works to that? Are you kidding me? Right. The devil was ecstatic. I got him. I defeated God. I am number one. Now when things kind of calmed down, there was a three-day reprieve, but the devil's got to sneak his suspicion. Man, you can't keep a good man down. Yeah. But he moved those chief priests and those elders, go to that Roman guy and have him tell him we need guards at this sepulcher. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you nuts? <laughs> Guard a dead body? I tell you, when, when people mess with the book, God messes with the brain. Amen. And so the devil had a sneak of suspicion. Of some, oh, they pawned it off that, oh, maybe the apostles are going to steal his body. But no, no, he, de the devil knows that book. He saw what was promised to Isaac, right. Abraham, going to raise from the dead. Yeah. He had a sneak suspicion. Something's going on here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. That Saturday night, sometime after 6 o'clock, maybe around 7 or 8, the spirits outside that sepulcher could hear something going on inside. Glory. Just a quiet yeah, he, thing was going on inside there. Wow. As the Lord Jesus Christ came up through those linen yeah, clothes. Lord, amen. And he took this thing head, head wrapping off and he says, I think I'll fold that up real nice and just set it right there. And then an angel pops in there and the Lord says, that was a pretty good show, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> Boy, did I make a fool out of him, didn't I? Amen. Boy, you sure did. Boy, it's beyond me. He said, well, I got to run to the Father a couple times. And after I'm out of here, I want you to, to see a big stone. I want you to push that out of the way. And there's a, there's a Roman rod, about a three-quarter inch rod that's in the rock there. You're going to shear that off like a plow shear. I've seen that. I've seen that rod. Man, that thing is right there. You don't want, you want to be real cautious when you point that out because the people at the garden tomb get real nervous. They're right there. <laughs> they get real nervous about that. He said, I want you to roll that away so there are going to be some folks coming up here in a little while and we're, we're going to get some action going on here. And he said, now after you do that, I want you to head up to Galilee. I want, there's some ladies I want you to go talk to and tell them, tell them about what happened. 
And then we'll, we'll get the apostles to find out what was going to happen too. And oh, by the way, uh, there's going to be some crazy stuff going on tonight. Because at that same time, that, that sepulcher, those cemetery east of town, with 175,000 graves, some of them things popped open. Yeah. And old grandpa <laughs> came out. And he walked 10 minutes into town. And he knocks on the door. <laughs> oh, who are you? <laughs> Don't you know? And they, and they get to preach at those people for a while. Yeah. Boy, what a night that would have been. Yeah, Saturday night, come Sunday morning, and the Savior, after a trip or two to the heaven to see the Father, not far away, it's not far. He meets the apostles and the women, and then that resurrection defeated Satan and turned the known world upside down. Yeah. And those apostles went crazy from then on out. I mean, can you imagine those dumb, thump apostles? Stupid fishermen. Yeah. You know, four of them fishermen, man, they just started going all out. And that resurrected, and we, they made an absolute fool of the devil. Amen. And what a person can do, you can honor the Savior by accepting his offering. Amen. We... It, I don't know. We, it seems that we cheapen it so much. Just take the, honor him. Yeah. Honor him by accepting the offering of grace that he has. And then worship him by becoming a worthy investment Amen. to him. What a big deal. It is beyond our imagination of what the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. did. And we could love him more for it. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord, I do pray that somehow we would see the, the bigness, the bigness of what you did. You were determined. There was no emotional wanderings with you. You set your face like a flint lamb led to slaughter, and you won. Up from the grave you arose. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to love you more because of it. And to honor you by chance if somebody's not accepted that offer. That they could honor you by accepting the offer. And then once we've accepted the offer, that we can be a worthy investment. That we could give back to you what you've given. Thank you so much for it. And we love you for it. In Jesus' holy name, amen.